Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 18 of the Gateway Project, in which we need to launch the P3 and P4 truss segments that contain the big, huge solar panels that will extend out on the port side. But first, we are boosting the orbit of the space station, because I've decided that it is too low, and I want to be able to go at 1,000x times warp speed sometimes and right now I can only go 100x warp speed so we're boosting the station up to 250 kilometers which will put us 10 kilometers above the minimum required for 1000x. Meanwhile Joseph Kerman's strange device seems to be heading for the moon. What could it possibly be doing at the moon? There's nothing there. There's no station. There's no satellites. This just doesn't make any sense at all. Well, anyway, in this episode, what we have to look forward to, other than the trust launch, that is, is a look inside a couple rockets that we never got to look into previously, as well as we're going to deorbit something really big and launch a couple missing ORUs. But first, let's go to the vehicle assembly building. Underneath the launcher, we have the S1 truss, which has on it an injection stage that lets us get it docked into place. This is the small fuel tank version of the uh, gyroscope that I was using. That was the one that had issues where we had to go up and get it again. So down here we have the old version of the interstellar radiators, which uh, so that was how it was launched up today. They don't actually look like that. Today they look like this. Right here, using the parts that I got from the near future pack. They're better looking radiators. They, they are that white texture that's just like a real radiator on the ISS. Underneath it has a platform that rotates on an infernal robotics docking washer. And I had these little jets placed in different spots on it to help me to maneuver it. On the bottom, we have a docking port, as well as on the top, another maneuvering jet on a strut. And all of that is gone now because we took all of that and we stuck it in a crate and we deorbited it. And then all the rest of it, this is all one part. Everything in there is welded together using the UBO welding mod. The P1 truss was the exact same thing. I took this out and I took this out, added some fuel to the top of it so that it would be able to deorbit. But the rest of it was exactly the same except for the insides. The insides, I welded a whole bunch of different parts. I took everything out of the S1 truss and then I put in a whole bunch of new stuff and then I welded that together. So the P1 and the S1 actually look different on the inside, but the rest of it, the structure was all the same. The ESP-2 was launched on a regular old rocket here with a standard injection stage underneath it that we will use to deorbit that. It has a few lights on the outside. I actually we'll probably want to move those up to be a little more centered now that I think about it. A few lights on the outside, some RCS jets to help me keep it stable as it's coming in for its docking. We have our node on the top and then it's a bunch of 6S compartments. Inside there, we stashed away that ESP-2 that's supposed to go on the side of the Quest airlock. On that, the intent is that I would take some of these and place them on the side of it to make it look like those are orbital replacement units. And I'll put some on each side of it. But I'll be doing that over the course of a few launches because that's how it really happened in our world as well. If I want to send up cargo, there's a lot of space in there for a bunch of parts inside those Kerbal attachment crates. And now, once again, Bill has been able to commission a special spacecraft that is his and his alone. In fact, this time, he's actually flying it. This is no automated deorbiting of debris. This is Bill going to collect it himself. As the great philosopher Confucius Kerman once said, if you want something done right, do it yourself. So if you remember back a few episodes, and honestly I can't actually remember how many it was, but we had a very large stage that was being used for orbital injection and it was supposed to have a pod on it. And I wasn't quite sure how it ended up not having a pod on it. 
but we left that in orbit and Bill is upset about it, so he's on his way to go grab that. Now the plan here is he has this very special Hydra cargo carrier that he's going to uh, take up with a electromagnet as well as a couple pipe endpoints. And one way or the other, he's expecting he should be able to latch on to the opposing craft. His first plan of attack is going to be to put a pipe endpoint on his craft and another pipe endpoint on the other, and then hopefully just sort of tow it. There's actually some family history there. His great-grandfather, William Kerman, owned a junkyard and drove a, a tow truck. So here we are, we're slowly easing our way in next to this orbital injection stage that is now defunct. We're going to pull in that solar panel just in case it bumps. We don't want to break that off. And now here he goes. Bill is actually getting to do a little bit of EVA. I guess it isn't just Bob. Bob's not the only one. Bill can do it too. So he's out here grabbing his pipe end point and hooking it up just like he planned. And while Bill is preparing this down on the ground, preparations are underway to launch that P3, P4 truss assembly. In our dimension, that was launched in September of 2006 on the space shuttle Atlantis, the STS-115. Oh dear, this is not going as planned. So that pipe, it stiffen up, stiffens up quite rigidly and doesn't really uh, work like a, a towing line like Bill would want it to. So he figures that what he needs to do then is move the pipe endpoint to the end of the ship, put it up close to the engine, then hook the other one up kind of uh, in line so that they could form a nice rigid, almost single body ship. The problem is there's no way to easily control this large stage here and make sure that it stays lined up the way that he wants. So instead, it, by the time he gets it all uh, hooked up, it's already crooked again. So once again, we start our burn, and actually at first it looks like it's going pretty well. Look at that. But uh, after a few seconds of trying to increase velocity, because it was just going way too slow otherwise, it starts to go out of control. All right, fine, we have an answer for that. Every single time we're pointing retro, we're going to turn the engines on. And every time we're pointing away, we're going to turn them off. So by turning them on and off, each time we go through, we're able to get into a suborbital trajectory. It's not much, but it is suborbital. With a quick check of the map right here, we can see that we actually are traveling down. Now, the downside of having it thrown off like it was right before it was really meaningfully suborbital and not just skipping through the atmosphere is that we had a very high apoapsis even though we have a periapsis now that is going through the atmosphere. And this is going to take quite a few orbits before it actually comes back down. In fact, I just turned it on and left the recorder off and walked away from my computer and came back later and it was finally gone when I came back. And so, Bill has returned to Kerbin. And that little man is now happy, so he will head back to Mission Control. And at Mission Control, we are now finally launching that P3 and P4 truss. They are act connected together already. They could have had the P5 on there as well. It is pretty small, but they're mimicking the launch sequence that was specified in the plans that came out of that anomaly way back in the beginning of this project. And in those plans, it does not call for the P5 to be on there yet. And of course, we only have P1 already on the station because there is no P2. That would have been a thruster unit, but we don't need thrusters on the station and they didn't have them on the real ISS either. And the reason why the P5 isn't going up yet, even though it's so small, is that they just weren't able to attach that due to the size of the space shuttle uh, cargo bay. There's only 18 meters in which to fit space shuttle cargo and uh, the entire truss assembly from P3 and 4 and 5 altogether would have been too big. So they had to bring that up on a separate launch. 
And with this one, this will bring me up to mission number 56 out of 143, which is a significant jump forward because after the Columbia disaster, there were a couple of years where no shuttles flew, so no additional segments of anything for the ISS went up. There were 14 launches in between before the Discovery STS-114 took up the Raffaello multi-purpose logistics module and the ESP-2, which uh, both were what we did last time, although I didn't technically call it the Raffaello, I called it the Leonardo because I'm not going to have all three versions of them. There's also a Donatello, but I won't be doing any of those. I'll just be using a, the Leonardo and then one day permanently docking the Leonardo to the bottom of the station. And now here comes that truss. Oh, ever so gently. Ease it into place and bam, there it is. Beautiful. That is sitting on an infernal robotics joint, which allows the entire assembly to rotate. So what we need to do now is just back off our orbital injection stage, our docking stage here, send that back to Kerbin to be destroyed, and then test out the deployment of this thing. So I actually haven't even tried this. This was the first piece of the station where I just threw it together in the assembly building, put it on a rocket, and sent it off, hoping that I hadn't screwed anything up on it. And now this right here is the first time that I'm actually trying out these solar panels. It occurred to me when I got up here that I never tried it out on the platform before launching. I didn't try the radiator. I didn't try opening the panels. I just launched it. And boy, am I glad it actually worked. In order to actually demonstrate rotating that gigantic assembly, we'll have to pull in the solar panel that's up on top. So we're pulling that one in while we extend the lower ones. Now, getting back to those uh, transfer vehicles, those logistics modules, I was saying that I was going to eventually dock that Leonardo because that's what happens in the real ISS as well. And after that, I don't think I'm going to need any of them anymore. So that's the only one I'm going to have. You might have noticed an interesting resemblance of those names there, the Raffaello, the Donatello, the Leonardo, those would be Italian artists perhaps, but uh, maybe something else too. Cowabunga, dude. All I've got to say is Michelangelo must be pretty pissed off he wasn't included in that little trio. So now Bob is heading out on an EVA because there were some extra RCS jets on that thing and we need to go collect those right off of that little truss. So you can see here as we're flying by, this is the part, this is the P3. The P4 is the part with the solar panels and the radiator on it. The P3 here, it's got uh, these, I'm pulling these off, these aren't really part of it. It's got four docking nodes on it because those are going to provide ways for us to attach uh, external cargo to it someday. We'll get to that in the future. Also, that was the part of the station truss there that has the rotator, the thing that I'm simulating with that Infernal Robotics giant docking washer. When I activate that control, the entire assembly on both sides, if we had both sides, right now we only have the one, but the entire assembly would rotate on that axis, allowing those massive solar panels to point toward the sun. We're about to launch Jebediah's transfer vehicle, the JTV. And we are only going to press the space bar to get this launched. I'm not going to control it at all because I'm going to show a uh, sort of gravity turn launch. The clamp right here has an angle to it. And if you look over at the controls for the yaw pitch and roll, you're going to see that I'm not controlling them at all. All I did was hit the space bar. And because of that angle on the launch clamp, it's already taking off at a slight angle over toward where the KSI KSS is right now. And notice that there's no control going on at all. You see that yaw pitch roll? Nothing. And it's just angling away. We are currently lifting off on only a solid rocket booster. And when that releases, then I will temporarily flip on the SAS just to stabilize things as the decoupling occurs. 
We've skipped ahead just a little bit because I figured it would be boring to watch the rest of that launch up until we get our staging here, but trust me, there still has been no control input whatsoever. We're still going up on just that original space bar and then another space bar just now. If you ask me, Jebediah is just showing off, but even though we skipped ahead again, there still has been no input other than two space bars, and just now we've turned on the SAS, so that's our first control since launch. We did that because we're getting up into the uh, upper atmosphere where it's a little thinner and we're going to go down, back down toward the surface if we don't stabilize here and keep heading up. He might be showing off just a little bit, but Jebediah also has some good intentions. He wanted to just show everybody how awesome it can be when you're in Ferrum Aerospace. You just put a couple fins down on the bottom of your rocket, you hit spacebar, you angle it just a tiny bit, and off it goes in the right direction. You don't have to do anything, it just automatically gravity turns all by itself. The payload in this is based loosely on a real spacecraft in our dimension called the Cygnus Orb, which is built by Orbital Sciences with the subcontractor being a Thales Alenia Space. Inside up top there we have some of the orbital replacement units that are supposed to go on the ESP-2 uh, the ESP that's currently attached outside the Quest airlock. Jebediah designed this craft to carry a just over one ton of cargo. The craft itself weighs 2.8 tons when it's fully loaded with fuel. And so now it's sliding into place and docking up so that Bob can go out and get those orbital replacement units and attach them to that airlock right there. You can see it as he flies by and goes out to get them. Now, obviously, I'm just using these Kerbal Attachment Boxes to represent those. They don't actually function for any kind of replacement, and I don't have anything inside them or anything like that. But if I did, in our dimension, those things might be stuff like power converters or cooling unit hoses and things like that that would allow them to repair the station just in case anything goes wrong. So we'll just fly back and forth here a little bit, setting up our little container bays and then shoving those orbital replacement units down into those. Those are of course representing the frams, the flight releasable attachment mechanisms. This particular ICC originally was launched supposedly with four places that had orbital replacement units already in them but I only launched it putting two of them on, and so this time I'm bringing up three. That way I can be one ahead. Uh, technically it can hold eight, or at least it's supposed to be able to hold eight if I'm representing the real one, and I think they might not actually get completely up to eight at any point, but it can hold that. Well anyway, by putting three more on here, now I feel a little bit better about having forgotten about two of them last time, because it was supposed to have four, now it has five. We're actually one ahead of the game. So it's time to go and pack up these doors, and then we can decouple that and send that back to deorbit. But once again, I am reminded not to sit in front of the door when I am opening or closing it. So, I'm going to begin my little trip back to the station here, and then when I get back, we can finally close those doors and then deorbit it. We'll attack this one from the side this time so that I don't go flying across the universe never to return, or maybe I'm exaggerating, but still, I was thrown pretty far away. So, decoupling, shifting down, pointing toward retro, off we go. And I love this particular moment because I get to switch around and look at the station as it's reseeding behind me with the spacecraft flying away. This part is so cool. I love watching this. All right, next time on the Gateway Project, we are going to launch the P5 truss, and I'll be moving one of the PMAs that I haven't actually moved when I should have moved it in the past. Uh, another little tiny details that sometimes slip through the cracks. We also need to send something to help explore Minmus. So, until next time, I'll see you later, Kerbinauts.